The Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, Book 2, Chapter 1. Virtue, or excellence, being twofold, partly intellectual and partly moral, intellectual virtue is both originated and fostered mainly by teaching. It therefore demands experience and time. Moral virtue, on the other hand, is the outcome of a habit, and accordingly its name is derived by slight deflection from habit. From this fact, it is clear that no moral virtue is implanted in us by nature. A law of nature cannot be altered by habituation. Thus, a stone naturally tends to fall downwards, and it cannot be habituated or trained to rise upwards, even if we were to habituate it by throwing it upwards 10,000 times. Nor again can fire be trained to sink downwards nor anything else that follows one natural law be habituated or trained to follow another. It is neither by nature, then, nor in defiance of nature, that virtues are implanted in us. Nature gives us the habit of receiving them, and that capacity is perfected by habit. Again, if we take the various natural powers which belong to us, we first acquire the proper faculties and afterwards display the activities. It is clearly so with the senses. It was not by seeing frequently or hearing frequently that we acquired the senses of seeing or hearing. On the contrary, it was because we possessed the senses that we made use of them, not by making use of them that we obtained them. But the virtues we acquire by first exercising them, as is the case with all the arts, for it is by doing what we ought to do when we have learned the arts that we learn the arts themselves. We become, for example, builders by building, and harpists by playing the harp. Similarly, it is by doing just acts that we become just, by doing temperate acts that we become temperate, by doing courageous acts that we become courageous. The experience of states is a witness to this truth, for it is by training the habits that legislators make the citizens good. This is the object which all legislators have at heart. If a legislator does not succeed in it, he fails of his purpose, and it constitutes the distinction between a good polity and a bad one. Again, the causes and means by which any virtue is produced and by which it is destroyed are the same, and it is equally so with any art. For it is by playing the harp that both good and bad harpists are produced, and the case of builders and all other artisans is similar, as it is by building well that they will be good builders, and by building badly that they will be bad builders. If it were not so, there would be no need of anybody to teach them. They would all be born good or bad in their several trades. The case of the virtues is the same. It is by acting in such transactions as take place between man and man that we become either just or unjust. It is by acting in the face of danger and by habituating ourselves to fear or courage that we become either cowardly or courageous. It is much the same with our desires and angry passions. Some people become temperate and gentle. Others become licentious and passionate, according as they conduct themselves in one way or another way in particular circumstances. In a word, moral states are the results of activities corresponding to the moral states themselves. It is our duty, therefore, to give a certain character to the activities, as the moral states depend upon the differences of the activities. Accordingly, the difference between one training of the habits and another from early days is not a light matter, but is serious or rather all-important. Chapter 2 Our present study is not, like other studies, purely speculative in its intention. For the object of our inquiry is not to know the nature of virtue but to become ourselves virtuous, as that is the sole benefit which it conveys. It is necessary, therefore, to consider the right way of performing actions, for it is actions, as we have said, that determine the character of the resulting moral states. That we should act in accordance with right reason is a common general principle, which may here be taken for granted. The nature of right reason and its relation to the virtues generally will be subjects of discussion hereafter. But it must be admitted at the outset that all reasoning upon practical matters must be like a sketch in outline. It cannot be scientifically exact. 
We began by laying down the principle that the kind of reasoning demanded in any subject must be such as the subject matter itself allows, and questions of practice and expediency no more admit of invariable rules than questions of health. But if this is true of general reasoning upon ethics, still more true is it that scientific exactitude is impossible in reasoning upon particular ethical cases. They do not fall under any art or any law, but the agents themselves are always bound to pay regard to the circumstances of the moment as much as in medicine or navigation. Still, although such is the nature of the present argument, we must try to make the best of it. The first point to be observed, then, is that in such matters as we are considering, deficiency and excess are equally fatal. It is so, as we observe, in regard to health and strength. For we must judge of what we cannot see by the evidence of what we do see. Excess or deficiency of gymnastic exercise is fatal to strength. Similarly, an excess or deficiency of meat and drink is fatal to health, whereas a suitable amount produces, augments, and sustains it. It is the same, then, with temperance, courage, and the other virtues. A person who avoids and is afraid of everything and faces nothing becomes a coward. A person who is not afraid of anything but is ready to face everything becomes foolhardy. Similarly, he who enjoys every pleasure and never abstains from any pleasure is licentious. He who eschews all pleasures like a boar is an insensible sort of person. For temperance and courage are destroyed by excess and deficiency but preserved by the mean state. Again, not only are the causes and the agencies of production, increase, and destruction in the moral states the same, but the sphere of their activity will be proved to be the same also. It is so in other instances which are more conspicuous, for example in strength. For strength is produced by taking a great deal of food and undergoing a great deal of labor. And it is the strong man who is able to take the most food and to undergo most labor. The same is the case with the virtues. It is by abstinence from pleasures that we become temperate, and when we have become temperate, we are best able to abstain from them. So too with courage. It is by habituating ourselves to despise and face alarms that we become courageous, and when we have become courageous, we shall be best able to face them. The pleasure or pain which follows upon actions may be regarded as a test of a person's moral state. He who abstains from physical pleasures and feels delight in so doing is temperate, but he who feels pain at doing so is licentious. He who faces dangers with pleasure, or at least without pain, is courageous, but he who feels pain at facing them is a coward. For moral virtue is concerned with pleasures and pain. It is pleasure which makes us do what is base, and pain which makes us abstain from doing what is noble. Hence the importance of having had a certain training from very early days, as Plato says, such a training as produces pleasure and pain at the right objects, for this is the true education. Again, if the virtues are concerned with actions and emotions, and every action and every emotion is attended by pleasure and pain, this will be another reason why virtue should be concerned with pleasures and pains. There is also a proof of this fact in the use of pleasure and pain as means of punishment, for punishments are in a sense remedial measures, and the means employed as remedies are naturally the opposites of the diseases to which they are applied. Again, as we said before, every moral state of the soul is in its nature relative to and concerned with the thing by which it is naturally made better or worse. But pleasures and pains are the causes of vicious moral states. If we pursue and avoid such pleasures and pains as are wrong, or pursue and avoid them at the wrong time or in the wrong manner, or in any other of the various ways in which it is logically possible to do wrong, Hence, it is that people actually define the virtues as certain apathetic or quiescent states, but they are wrong in using this absolute language, and not qualifying it by the addition of the right or wrong manner, time, and so on. It may be assumed, then, that moral virtue tends to produce the best action in respect of pleasures and pains, and that vice is its opposite. But there is another way in which we may see the same truth. There are three things which influence us to desire them, the noble, the expedient, and the pleasant. 
and three opposite things which influence us to eschew them, the shameful, the injurious, and the painful. The good man, then, will be likely to take a right line, and the bad man to take a wrong one, in respect of all these, but especially in respect of pleasure. For pleasure is felt not by man only, but by the lower animals, and is associated with all things that are matters of desire, as the noble and the expedient alike appear pleasant. Pleasure, too, is fostered in us all from early childhood, so that it is difficult to get rid of the emotion of pleasure, as it is deeply ingrained in our life. Again, we make pleasure and pain, in a greater or less degree, the standard of our actions. It is inevitable, therefore, that our present study should be concerned from first to last with pleasures and pains, for right or wrong feelings of pleasure or pain have a material influence upon actions. Again, it is more difficult to contend against pleasure than against anger, as Heraclitus says. And it is not what is easy, but what is comparatively difficult, that is in all cases the sphere of art or virtue, as the value of success is proportionate to the difficulty. This, then, is another reason why moral virtue and political science should be exclusively occupied with pleasures and pains. For to make a good use of pleasures and pains is to be a good man and to make a bad use of them is to be a bad man. We may regard it, then, as established that virtue is concerned with pleasures and pains, that the causes which produce it are also the means by which it is augmented, or, if they assume a different character, is destroyed, and that the sphere of its activity is the things which were themselves the causes of its production. Chapter 3 but it may be asked what we mean by saying that people must become just by doing what is just and temperate by doing what is temperate. For if they do what is just and temperate, they are ipso facto proved, it will be said, to be just and temperate in the same way as if they practice grammar and music, they are proved to be grammarians and musicians. But is not the answer that the case of the arts is not the same? For a person may do something that is grammatical either by chance or at the suggestion of somebody else. Hence, he will not be a grammarian unless he not only does what is grammatical but does it in a grammatical manner, for example, in virtue of the grammatical knowledge which he possesses. There is another point, too, of difference between the arts and the virtues. The productions of art have their excellence in themselves. It is enough, therefore, that when they are produced, they should be of a certain character. But actions in accordance with virtue are not, for example, justly or temperately performed because they are in themselves just or temperate. It is necessary that the agent at the time of performing them should satisfy certain conditions. For example, in the first place, that he should know what he is doing. Secondly, that he should deliberately choose to do it, and to do it for its own sake. And thirdly, that he should do it as an instance of a settled and immutable moral state. If it be a question whether a person possesses any art, these conditions, except indeed the condition of knowledge, are not taken into account. But if it be a question of possessing the virtues, the mere knowledge is of little or no avail. And it is the other conditions which are the results of frequently performing just and temperate actions that are not of slight but of absolute importance. Accordingly, deeds are said to be just and temperate when they are such as a just or temperate person would do. And a just and temperate person is not merely one who does these deeds, but one who does them in the spirit of the just and the temperate. It may fairly be said, then, that a just man becomes just by doing what is just, and a temperate man becomes temperate by doing what is temperate. And if a man did not so act, he would not have so much as a chance of becoming good. But most people, instead of doing such actions, take refuge in theorizing. They imagine that they are philosophers, and that philosophy will make them virtuous. In fact, they behave like people who listen attentively to their doctors but never do anything that their doctors tell them. But it is as improbable that a healthy state of the soul will be produced by this kind of philosophizing as that a healthy state of the body will be produced by this kind of medical treatment. Chapter 4 We have next to consider the nature of virtue. Now, as the qualities of the soul are three, 
emotions, faculties, and moral states, it follows that virtue must be one of the three. By the emotions, I mean desire, anger, fear, courage, envy, joy, love, hatred, regret, emulation, pity, in a word, whatever is attended by pleasure or pain. I call those faculties in respect of which we are said to be capable of experiencing these emotions. For example, capable of getting angry or being pained or feeling pity. And I call those moral states in respect of which we are well or ill disposed towards the emotions. Ill disposed, for example, towards the passion of anger, if our anger be too violent or too feeble and well disposed if it be duly moderated, and similarly toward the other emotions. Now, neither the virtues nor the vices are emotions, for we are not called good or evil in respect of our emotions, but in respect of our virtues or vices. Again, we are not praised or blamed in respect of our emotions. A person is not praised for being afraid or being angry, nor blamed for being angry in an absolute sense but only for being angry in a certain way. But we are praised or blamed in respect of our virtues or vices. Again, whereas we are angry or afraid without deliberate purpose, the virtues are in some sense deliberate purposes, or do not exist in the absence of deliberate purpose. It may be added that while we are said to be moved in respect of our emotions, in respect of our virtues or vices, we are not said to be moved, but to have a certain disposition. These reasons also prove that the virtues are not faculties, for we are not called either good or bad, nor are we praised or blamed as having an abstract capacity for emotion. Also, while nature gives us our faculties, it is not nature that makes us good or bad. But this is a point which we have already discussed. If, then, the virtues are neither emotions nor faculties, it remains that they must be moral states. Chapter 5. The nature of virtue has now been generically described, but it is not enough to state merely that virtue is a moral state. We must also describe the character of that moral state. It must be laid down then that every virtue or excellence has the effect of producing a good condition of that of which it is a virtue or excellence, and of enabling it to perform its function well. Thus, the excellence of the eye makes the eye good and its function good, as it is by the excellence of the eye that we see well. Similarly, the excellence of the horse makes a horse excellent and good at racing, at carrying its rider and at facing the enemy. If, then, this is universally true, the virtue or excellence of man will be such a moral state as makes a man good and able to perform his proper function well. We have already explained how this will be the case, but another way of making it clear will be to study the nature or character of this virtue. Now, in everything, whether it be continuous or discrete, it is possible to take a greater, a smaller, or an equal amount, and this either absolutely or in relation to ourselves, the equal being a mean between excess and deficiency. By the mean in respect of the thing itself, or the absolute mean, I understand that which is equally distinct from both extremes, and this is one and the same thing for everybody. By the mean considered relatively to ourselves, I understand that which is neither too much nor too little. But this is not one thing, nor is it the same for everybody. Thus, if ten be too much and two too little, we take six as a mean in respect of the thing itself. For six is as much greater than two as it is less than ten and this is a mean in arithmetical proportion. But the mean considered relatively to ourselves must not be ascertained in this way. It does not follow that if 10 pounds of meat be too much and two be too little for a man to eat, a trainer will order him six pounds, as if this may itself be too much or too little for the person who is to take it. It will be too little, for example, for Milo, but too much for a beginner in gymnastics. Footnote. Milo was the famous Crotoniate wrestler. It will be the same with running and wrestling. The right amount will vary with the individual. This being so, everybody who understands his business avoids alike excess and deficiency. He seeks and chooses the mean, not the absolute mean, but the mean considered relatively to ourselves. 
Every science, then, performs its function well if it regards the mean and refers the works which it produces to the mean. This is the reason why it is usually said of successful works that it is impossible to take anything from them or to add anything to them, which implies that excess or deficiency is fatal to excellence, but that the mean state ensures it. Good artists, too, as we say, have an eye to the mean in their works. But virtue, like nature herself, is more accurate and better than any part. Virtue, therefore, will aim at the mean. I speak of moral virtue, as it is moral virtue which is concerned with emotions and actions, and it is these which admit of excess and deficiency and the mean. Thus, it is possible to go too far or not to go far enough in respect of fear, courage, desire, anger, pity, and pleasure and pain generally, and the excess and the deficiency are alike wrong. But to experience these emotions at the right times and on the right occasions and toward the right persons and for the right causes and in the right manner is the mean or the supreme good, which is characteristic of virtue. Similarly, there may be excess, deficiency, or the mean in regard to actions. But virtue is concerned with emotions and actions. And here, excess is an error and deficiency a fault, whereas the mean is successful and laudable, and success and merit are both characteristics of virtue. It appears, then, that virtue is a mean state, so far at least as it aims at the mean. Again, there are many different ways of going wrong, for evil is in its nature infinite, to use the Pythagorean figure, but good is finite. But there is only one possible way of going right, Accordingly, the former is easy and the latter difficult. It is easy to miss the mark, but difficult to hit it. This, again, is a reason why excess and deficiency are characteristics of vice, and the mean state a characteristic of virtue. Quote, For good is simple, evil manifold. Unquote. Footnote, a line, perhaps Pythagorean, of unknown authorship. Chapter 6 Virtue, then, is a state of deliberate moral purpose consisting in a mean that is relative to ourselves, the mean being determined by reason, or as a prudent man would determine it. It is a mean state, firstly, as lying between two vices, the vice of excess on the one hand, and the vice of deficiency on the other, and, secondly, because whereas the vices either fall short of or go beyond what is proper in the emotions and actions, Virtue not only discovers but embraces the mean. Accordingly, virtue, if regarded in its essence or theoretical conception, is a mean state, but if regarded from the point of view of the highest good or of excellence, it is an extreme. But it is not every action or every emotion that admits of a mean state. There are some whose very name implies wickedness, as, for example, malice, shamelessness, and envy among emotions, or adultery, theft, and murder, among actions. All these, and others like them, are censored as being intrinsically wicked, not merely the excesses or deficiencies of them. It is never possible, then, to be right in respect of them. They are always sinful. Right or wrong in such actions as adultery does not depend on our committing them with the right person, at the right time, or in the right manner. On the contrary, it is sinful to do anything of that kind at all. It would be equally wrong, then, to suppose that there can be a mean state or an excess or deficiency in unjust, cowardly, or licentious conduct. For if it were so, there would be a mean state of an excess or of a deficiency, an excess of an excess and a deficiency of a deficiency. But, as in temperance and courage, there can be no excess or deficiency because the mean is, in a sense, an extreme. So, too, in these cases, there cannot be a mean or an excess or deficiency. But, however the acts may be done, they are wrong. For it is a general rule that an excess or deficiency does not admit of a mean state, nor a mean state of an excess or deficiency. Chapter 7 but it is not enough to lay down this as a general rule. It is necessary to apply it to particular cases, as in reasonings upon actions general statements, although they are broader, are less exact than particular statements. 
for all action refers to particulars, and it is essential that our theories should harmonize with the particular cases to which they apply. We must take particular virtues, then, from the catalog of virtues. In regard to feelings of fear and confidence, courage is a mean state. On the side of excess, he whose fearlessness is excessive has no name, as often happens, but he whose confidence is excessive is foolhardy while he whose timidity is excessive and whose confidence is deficient is a coward. In respect of pleasures and pains, although not indeed of all pleasures and pains, and to a less extent in respect of pains than of pleasures, the mean state is temperance, the excess is licentiousness. We never find people who are deficient in regard to pleasures. Accordingly, such people again have not received a name, but we may call them insensible. As regards the giving and taking of money, the mean state is liberality. The excess and deficiency are prodigality and illiberality. Here the excess and deficiency take opposite forms. For while the prodigal man is excessive in spending and deficient in taking, the illiberal man is excessive in taking and deficient in spending. For the present, we are giving only a rough and summary account of the virtues, and that is sufficient for our purposes. We will hereafter determine their character more exactly. In respect of money, there are other dispositions as well. There is a mean state, which is magnificence. For the magnificent man, as having to do with large sums of money, differs from the liberal man who has to do only with small sums and the excess corresponding to it is bad taste or vulgarity. The deficiency is meanness. These are different from the excess and deficiency of liberality. What the difference is will be explained hereafter. In respect of honor and dishonor, the mean state is high-mindedness. The excess is what is called vanity. The deficiency, little-mindedness. Corresponding to liberality, which as we said differs from magnificence as having to do not with great but with small sums of money, there is a moral state which has to do with petty honor and is related to high-mindedness, which has to do with great honor. For it is possible to aspire to honor in the right way or in a way which is excessive or insufficient. And if a person's aspirations are excessive, he is called ambitious. If they are deficient, he is called unambitious, while if they are between the two, he has no name. The dispositions too are nameless, except that the disposition of the ambitious person is called ambition. The consequence is that the extremes lay claim to the mean or intermediate place. We ourselves speak of one who observes the mean sometimes as ambitious, and at other times as unambitious. We sometimes praise an ambitious and at other times an unambitious person. The reason for our doing so will be stated in due course, but let us now discuss the other virtues in accordance with the method which we have followed hitherto. Anger, like other emotions, has its excess, its deficiency, and its mean state. It may be said that they have no names, but as we call one who observes the mean gentle, we will call the mean state gentleness. Among the extremes, if a person errs on the side of excess, he may be called passionate, and his vice passionateness. If on that of deficiency, he may be called impassive, and his deficiency impassivity. There are also three other mean states with a certain resemblance to each other, and yet with a difference. For while they are all concerned with intercourse in speech and action, they are different in that one of them is concerned with truth in such intercourse, and the others with pleasantness, one with pleasantness in amusement, and the other with pleasantness in the various circumstances of life. We must, therefore, discuss these states in order to make it clear that in all cases it is the mean state which is an object of praise, and the extremes are neither right nor laudable, but censurable. It is true that these mean and extreme states are generally nameless, but we must do our best here as elsewhere to give them a name, so that our argument may be clear and easy to follow. In the matter of truth, then, he who observes the mean may be called truthful, and the mean state truthfulness. Pretense, if it takes the form of exaggeration, is boastfulness, and one who is guilty of pretense is a boaster. 
But if it takes the form of deprecation, it is irony, and he who is guilty of it is ironical. As regards pleasantness in amusement, he who observes the mean is witty, and his disposition wittiness. The excess is buffoonery, and he who is guilty of it is a buffoon. Whereas he who is deficient in wit may be called a bore, and his moral state boorishness. As to the other kind of pleasantness, for example, pleasantness in life, he who is pleasant in a proper way is friendly, and his mean state friendliness. But he who goes too far, if he has no ulterior object in view, is obsequious. While if his object is self-interest, he is a flatterer. And he who does not go far enough and always makes himself unpleasant is a quarrelsome and morose sort of person. There are also mean states in the emotions and in the expression of the emotions. For although modesty is not a virtue, yet a modest person is praised as if he were virtuous. For here, too, one person is said to observe the mean and another to exceed it. As, for example, the bashful man who is never anything but modest whereas a person who has insufficient modesty or no modesty at all is called shameless, and one who observes the mean modest. Righteous indignation, again, is a mean state between envy and malice. They are all concerned with the pain and pleasure which we feel at the fortunes of our neighbors. A person who is righteously indignant is pained at the prosperity of the undeserving. But the envious person goes further and is pained at anybody's prosperity and the malicious person is so far from being pained that he actually rejoices at misfortunes. We shall have another opportunity, however, of discussing these matters. But in regard to justice, as the word is used in various senses, we will afterwards define those senses and explain how each of them is a mean state, and we will follow the same course with the intellectual virtues. Chapter 8 there are then three dispositions, two being vices, for example, one the vice of excess and the other that of deficiency, and one virtue, which is the mean state between them, and they are all in a sense mutually opposed, for the extremes are opposed both to the mean and to each other, and the mean is opposed to the extremes, for as the equal if compared with the less is greater, but if compared with the greater is less, so the mean states whether in the emotions or in actions, if compared with the deficiencies, are excessive, but if compared with the excesses, are deficient. Thus, the courageous man appears foolhardy as compared with the coward, but cowardly as compared with the foolhardy. Similarly, the temperate man appears licentious as compared with the insensible, but insensible as compared with the licentious, and the liberal man appears prodigal, as compared with the illiberal, but illiberal as compared with the prodigal. The result is that the extremes mutually repel and reject the mean. The coward calls the courageous man foolhardy, but the foolhardy man calls him cowardly, and so on in the other cases. But while there is this mutual opposition between the extremes and the mean, there is greater opposition between the two extremes than between either extreme and the mean for they are further removed from each other than from the mean, as the great from the small and the small from the great than both from the equal. Again, while some extremes exhibit more or less similarity to the mean, as foolhardiness to courage and prodigality to liberality, there is the greatest possible dissimilarity between the extremes. But things which are furthest removed from each other are defined to be opposites. Hence, the further things are removed the greater is the opposition between them. It is in some cases the deficiency, and in others the excess which is more opposed to the mean. Thus, it is not foolhardiness the excess, but cowardice the deficiency, which is the more opposed to courage. Nor is it insensibility the deficiency, but licentiousness the excess, which is the more opposed to temperance. There are two reasons why this should be so. One lies in the nature of the thing itself. For as one of the two extremes is the nearer and more similar to the mean, it is not this extreme, but its opposite that we chiefly set against the mean. For instance, as it appears that foolhardiness is more similar and nearer to courage than cowardice, it is cowardice that we chiefly set against courage. 
for things which are further removed from the mean seem to be more opposite to it. This being one reason which lies in the nature of the thing itself. There is a second which lies in our own nature. It is the things to which we ourselves are naturally more inclined that appear more opposed to the mean. Thus we are ourselves naturally more inclined to pleasures than to their opposites and are more prone, therefore, to licentiousness than to decorum. Accordingly, we speak of those things in which we are more likely to run to great lengths, as being more opposed to the mean. Hence it follows that licentiousness, which is an excess, is more opposed to temperance than insensibility. Chapter 9 It has now been sufficiently shown that moral virtue is a mean state, and in what sense it is a mean state. It is a mean state as lying between two vices, a vice of excess on the one side and a vice of deficiency on the other, and as aiming at the mean in the emotions and actions. That is the reason why it is so hard to be virtuous, for it is always hard work to find the mean in anything. For example, it is not everybody, but only a man of science who can find the mean or center of a circle. So, too, anybody can get angry. That is an easy matter, and anybody can give or spend money, but to give it to the right persons, to give the right amount of it, and to give it at the right time, and for the right cause, and in the right way, this is not what anybody can do, nor is it easy. That is the reason why it is rare and laudable and noble to do well. Accordingly, one who aims at the mean must begin by departing from that extreme which is the more contrary to the mean. He must act in the spirit of Calypso's advice. Quote, Far from this smoke and swell, keep thou thy bark. Unquote. For of the two extremes, one is more sinful than the other. As it is difficult, then, to hit the mean exactly, we must take the second best course, as the saying is, and choose the lesser of two evils. And this we shall do in the best way that we have described. For example, by steering clear of the evil which is further from the mean. We must also observe the things to which are ourselves particularly prone, as different natures have different inclinations, and we may ascertain what these are by a consideration of our feelings of pleasure and pain, and then we must drag ourselves in the direction opposite to them, for it is by removing ourselves as far as possible from what is wrong that we shall arrive at the mean, as we do when we pull a crooked stick straight. But in all cases, we must especially be on our guard against what is pleasant and against pleasure, as we are not impartial judges of pleasure. Hence, our attitude towards pleasure must be like that of the elders of the people in the Iliad toward Helen, and we must never be afraid of applying the words they use. For if we dismiss pleasure as they dismissed Helen, we shall be less likely to go wrong. It is by action of this kind, to put it summarily, that we shall best succeed in hitting the mean. It may be admitted that this is a difficult task, especially in particular cases. It is not easy to determine, for example, the right manner, objects, occasions, and duration of anger. There are times when we ourselves praise people who are deficient in anger, and we call them gentle. And there are other times when we speak of people who exhibit a savage temper as spirited. It is not, however, one who deviates a little from what is right, but one who deviates a great deal, whether on the side of excess or of deficiency, that is censored. For he is sure to be found out. Again, it is not easy to decide theoretically how far and to what extent a man may go before he becomes censorable. But neither is it easy to define theoretically anything else within the region of perception. Such things fall under the head of particulars, and our judgment of them depends upon our perception. So much then is plain, that the mean state is everywhere laudable, but that we ought to incline at one time toward the excess and at another towards the deficiency. For this will be our easiest manner of hitting the mean, or in other words of attaining excellence.